So welcome everyone to our webinar today. So please, you've decided to join and gain some more information on employment before, during, and after post-secondary, and really how finding employment is going to help support uh, not only paying for school, but gaining some great experience, of course, upon graduation that's going to help you going forward with your careers. Uh, just so you know who's speaking to you today, my name is Chandra Dreviani. I'm here with my colleague, Liz Harding. We're on camera right now. We're going to go off camera here in, a, in just a moment as we get into our presentation. But just so you know who we are, both Liz and I and our team at ELOF work with job seekers from students and grads, professionals and executives, and we teach job search skills that help ensure uh, people land employment as quickly as possible. You know, the job market really is a competitive place. Uh, it has been for a long time at all levels and in all areas. And our team is experienced at making sure that people, working with people across professions and industries and making sure they really do a great job when they get into the job market. So do you have a great cover letter? Make sure they have a great resume. Uh, interview skills, are they interview ready? Uh, job search strategies for the Canadian and North American market. And you know, how do you network effectively out there? So so that's really the type of work that we do every day uh, in our business. I'm going to be kicking off our presentation today discussing why employment before and during post-secondary is important and also giving you some tips on how and where to access job opportunities. Um, I'll also talk about the five building blocks you should ensure you have in place to conduct a great job search. And then I'll pass things over to Liz and she'll be providing you some tips. Uh, to get you set up with a great LinkedIn profile, along with some resume and interview tips. Uh, just so you know, following our webinar, if you'd like further information, uh, we've provided some downloadable tip sheets at our exhibitor booth. Perhaps some of you have already been there and grabbed those. Uh, you can also check out on our website, elofcareers.com. Uh, we do have some online on-demand job search courses. All of Liz and I, our knowledge poured into those courses available. Uh, they're available for purchase and we've provided a discount code here. Again, more information at our exhibitor booth if you're interested in checking out those courses. And uh, I think right now what we'll do, Liz and I will go off camera uh, as we jump into our presentation and then at the end we'll take your questions and we'll come back on camera and answer those questions. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and jump in here. So depending on your age, you may already be working in a job and if not, it's worth thinking about why empl employment before post-secondary could be helpful to you. So let's take a look and talk about a few things. You know, for some scholarships, employment may be a requirement. So it's something to keep in mind. I know there's been presentations today about scholarships. I'm sure many of you have attended. Uh, so, and certainly, work experience is not going to be a detriment to a scholarship application. So something to keep in mind in terms of why you might want to work before post-secondary. Of course, this is pretty obvious. It's going to help you build funds for education and your living expenses. You can save your money. You'll be more comfortable when you go away to school and feel more confident and not have that financial stress. It'll help you gain valuable work experience, which is really going to help make you more attractive to co-op employers. So co-op co-op programs are great programs. Uh, the schools often will help you in finding work. Uh, you may you may apply into a co-op or move into a co-op once you're at post-secondary, and it, it really does. This work experience is going to help make you more attractive to those employers. And of course, it helps give you real skills development. And I use my daughter, uh, Madeline, most recently worked at a grocery store as a cashier. And you know, uh, some of the skills she developed as an example that are really helpful and gonna help as she moves forward, of course, customer service skills. So a great example of gaining some real experience before going to post-secondary, she's in grade 11, um, and taking that forward with her as she, uh, as she goes into post-secondary. So during post-secondary, of course, working is gonna help you to continue to save your money and pay for your education and living expenses, reducing that financial stress. You know, optimally, you want to look at about 15 hours a week. We find that this is a great amount of time and what we would recommend to help you in building your resume uh, skills. And also, it's going to make you really force you to be organized. If you're working and you're going to school, uh, you're going to have to be organized, which is a great skill, right, to demonstrate to an employer as you get out there. 
Working during post-secondary can also help demonstrate in-demand transferable skills to future employers. Now, you may be wondering what are transferable skills, and I'll, I'll kind of speak to these with a, a quick example. I worked with a young man who was an engineering grad out of McGill a number of years ago, and uh, he, I knew his dad, actually. I'd worked with his dad years and years before, and uh, he was having trouble finding his first job post-graduation, and his dad said, can you talk to him? Can you help him with his resume, maybe help him with his interviewing skills? And I got to know him. I started talking to him and his resume was one page. It was pretty technical, you know, experience. It was very related to his engineering degree. And when I started talking to him, I discovered that he had been a Don in his residence while he went through university to help paying for uh, his university fees. And uh, as I, I said to him, what did you do in your job? He said, well, I had to, you know, help students that had disputes get through that. And I had a team of people and we would organize events and uh, we did some, some planning. Uh, I would tour students and, and uh, parents around, etc. So what he was talking about were transferable skills, organization, communication, leadership, and planning. So these are great skills. They're called transferable skills and employers love to see them. So work experience is going to give you those skills. And here again, making you more attractive to employers post-graduation, gaining that real, real uh, world work experience. Post-graduation employment. So post-graduation, it's really important to showcase your human skills. This is going to be really important as you get out there. So the research that we see on the future of work uh, really speaks to the fact that we're entering a skills revolution. What does that mean? Well, it's not just a jobs economy. You have a job and you have certain skills for that job. But gaining skills and continually gaining skills is what employers are looking for. So by getting that, that work experience, you're going to be gaining those real skills skills, those transferable skills, those human skills. So it's important to keep in mind that academics is only part of the picture. Employers prefer to hire graduates with strong work experience. And certainly we've seen this with the people that we work with within our business. Uh, there's evidence of learning adapting uh, in a working environment. So obviously, if you're out there and you're working, you're showing that you're adaptable uh, to change, etc, which employers really value. And working before and during school really does help get your job market ready. So you may be wondering, how do you go about finding work? Uh, certainly, if you've never looked for a job before, it can be pretty daunting to know where to begin. <laughs> so I want to give you a few tips on the best ways that we've seen for finding work out there. And, and really, you know, these some of these would apply before post-secondary and also during post-secondary. Uh, getting a referral from a friend already working somewhere that you're interested in is the probably the best way to find uh, a job opportunity. So where do your friends work, people you know? Could you ask them, you know, are there any opportunities here? Would you be able to submit my resume or my application? Looking at job opportunities and postings online, maybe you know of some uh, organizations or some employers in your local area, and you could go to their website and see if they have things posted. Great website here in Canada is indeed.ca, I-N-D-E-E-D.ca. -E -E you may know of it. It's an aggregator, so it brings job postings in from all different job boards and locations. So you can go in there and search in your location and with keywords. So it's a great one to check out. Um, also check out your local government employment services. The local uh, municipalities, the government often have summer job programs and also youth employment programs. So you could check out those, see if you qualify for a program or see if they even have job postings you could access. Uh, maybe you could work for your parents. Maybe you could work for a neighbor. Might be a possibility. Uh, something to think about. Maybe there's some work they have for you to do that can add to your uh, resume. And then also a great idea here to find an employer in your hometown who can continue to employ you during the school year. So thinking about, well, what employer is nearby to me here before I go away to school? And maybe, you know, let's say, I don't know, we've got some examples up here on screen just as examples, but these employers may be in the town that you go to or the city you go to to go to school. So they'd be more open to hiring you because you already have work experience with them. When you get to post-secondary, so I've added a link here and you can find this link in our exhibitor booth. Because some of you, obviously I realize might be international students, uh, this link will provide you information on uh, work study options in Canada. It's not an area of expertise for us here at Eloft, but we wanted to provide that link so you could get a bit more information. So you can copy down that link, it'll be up for a moment here or two, or visit our exhibitor booth and you can grab that link as well.
Uh, apply for on-campus jobs. There are lots of jobs on campuses. Get in touch with your campus career center in the summer. Um, you might be able to get first in line for campus work study. Uh, this, these jobs tend to be for OSAP students first, they tend to get priority, but you can ask your campus career center what opportunities are out there. And also campus job boards. There are lots of jobs again on campus, which was easy if you're living on campus, uh, you can check out the campus job boards. Your campus career center should have information on that. Uh, explore nearby off-campus opportunities as well. Uh, become a Don. I think I used my example there. Develop some great leadership skills. If that's something that interests you, if you are going into a residence environment, becoming a rep uh, on your floor is a great idea for your first year to set you up for becoming a Don in the second and future years. And then LinkedIn, and we're going to talk about LinkedIn in a little bit more detail. Uh, Liz is a little bit uh, in a little bit in our presentation and give you some more information, but it really is a strategic weapon for all students. It's all about the network out there. So thinking about when you're in post-secondary, building your LinkedIn profile. And my nephew recently graduated from McMaster University, and I watched over the years, he sort of set up his LinkedIn in first year, and then he was connecting to people. And now as he's graduated, he's actually landed a full-time job at one of the big banks, uh, but he did a great job building his networks on LinkedIn and eventually, you know, was able to tap into that network uh, to help him out as he moved forward. Okay, so I'm going to move us forward here and talk to you a little bit about the building blocks of a great job search. And I want to walk you through five building blocks. Um, the first one is resume and cover letter. So before you get out into the job market, you want to think about having a, what I like to call a master version, or maybe you call it a draft version of your resume. And every time you apply to a job opportunity, you want to customize that resume to suit the job. Um, and what I mean by that is looking at the job you're applying to, if you've got, say, a job posting or a job ad and finding, you know, what are the things in that job that you have to offer an employer? And are you showcasing that in your resume properly? Sending a generic resume is not going to get you very far in the job market. You know, just same resume for every job you apply to. It's not going to work very well. Having a cover letter, you know, you may or may not need a cover letter depending on what stage uh, you're at, but it's always, it's never going to be a detriment to include, you know, some sort of cover letter. You could draft up a cover letter and then again, just put a little bit, uh, customize that and pro provide some information um, in, uh, in terms of uh, showing what you have to offer a potential employer. My caution here to you is that sending a poorly prepared cover letter and or resume may limit your chances of landing an interview. So let's say you've got a resume and you don't even realize it's got spelling mistakes in it or the cover letter, your standard cover letter uses got spelling mistakes in it. Spelling mistakes is a classic example. An employer is going to look at it and they may very well just forget about interviewing you because if you're sloppy on a cover letter or resume, it's not really sending a great message to a potential employer. So make sure you get some somebody you know um, to proofread and make sure it looks really professional. And Liz is going to be providing some tips to you as well on developing a resume and showing an example. Our building block number two here, interview preparation. Um, so preparing, uh, you want to think about preparing responses to typical interview questions. What are typical interview questions? Well, typical interview question, tell me about yourself. This is a great one. Um, it's often asked at the opening of an interview. And, you know, you could go on about, I don't know, your personal life or your uh, whatever, your, your pets or whatever. But a better idea is to prepare for this question in a way that allows you to say, okay, this is the job I'm being interviewed for. And this is my experience. How am I going to introduce myself in a way that's going to be of benefit to help build the case for why I'm a great candidate for this job, right? So preparing for a question like that. Another common or typical question is, uh, why do you want to work here? You know, you want to have a response to that. You don't want to say something like, well, because you have a job posting, that's not good enough. <laughs> There'll be other people that are going to say other things that are more impressive than that. So again, when Liz gets into the interview tips, we'll, we'll give you some ideas here. And as well, our downloadable tip sheets will give you some ideas on how to prepare for that. You may have heard of uh, preparing star stories. This is a concept that we teach and again, a bit more information in our tip sheet on this. Star stories help you prepare for questions like, tell me about a time you dealt with a difficult customer. You know, which could be a common one if you're going to go into a job that um, uh, deals with customers. And you want to be able to share an example 
called a star story in order to show the employer that you've got some great experience in this area. The caution here, you know, once you start your job search, you may be contacted quickly to attend an interview. That would be my hope for all of you. And preparing at the last minute is going to lead to poor performance and possibly the door closed at that employer, right? You've had your chance, you've had your interview, and now you're, you know, the door is closed because you didn't do your prep. Our third of five building block, uh, blocks I want to talk to you about is interview practice. So you've gone ahead and you've prepped for the interview, but now actually practicing out loud is really important. So can you do a practice or what we call a mock interview to help polish your communication skills? Um, this is a great idea. Uh, a lot of people we know might do this with a parent or a friend, or maybe you know somebody that works in human resources who are commonly the people that interview job candidates. Uh, just find somebody you can practice with. Uh, the other option I might recommend is that you practice on video and look at um, your responses um, and see how you did, you know, critique yourself in terms of how you did. Caution here is really lack of practice it might cause you and your interview responses to be too long maybe too short or unfocused, causing the interviewer to pass you over for someone else. It's really easy to say, okay, I've prepped, I've thought about how I'm going to respond. But when you actually get into the situation, you might be nervous. And if you've practiced out loud, it really does help. Our fourth building block here is preparing your references. So contact your references early in your job search and ask permission to use their name. Now, who do you use as a reference? Um, ideally, you want to use somebody in a position of authority. Um, so what do I mean by that? Of course, a past manager that you left on good terms and they would be willing to be a reference would be a great one. But if you don't have that, if say you're out looking for your first job, uh, do you have a teacher you could use as a reference or a professor if you're in post-secondary? Do you have a, um, a coach maybe that you were on a team with? Somebody in a position of authority. You don't want to ask your mom or dad. You don't want to ask an aunt or uncle, ideally, if you can help it, or a friend. Personal references aren't the best. You want to think about, well, who, and, and volunteer work too. If you've done some volunteer work, that also could be somebody you could use as a reference, the person that sort of uh, was your manager there. Caution here, you may be asked for references early in the job search, so be sure to contact your references early on uh, so you're ready when asked with the references. Again, it's a great impression to an employer, you're organized, here are my references. My last building block here before I pass things uh, over to Liz is social media review and preparation. And I can't emphasize how important this is. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you review and make private your personal social media accounts once you get out into the job market. So any social media you use for personal purposes, make it private to the people you're connected to. OK, um, conduct an Internet search to uncover your digital footprint out there in the marketplace. Um, what do I mean by digital footprint? Well, if you go into, let's say you go into Google search engine, you can go into a mode called incognito, do an incognito search, which discounts your past browsing history. Put your name into the Google um, uh, search engine and see what comes up. That's what an employer is going to find. Is that going to support your professional brand? Is that supporting who you want to be out there in the job market? Um, and ensure as well that you set up a professional LinkedIn profile. Again, as you get into post-secondary, looking at having a LinkedIn is going to be really helpful to you. The caution here, employers do begin and end their job search online. Negative information or photos online might prevent an employer from contacting you for an interview. And Liz and I certainly have seen this uh, come, come to life for some people that are out there in the job market, and they've got some stuff online that they really shouldn't when they're out in the job market. So those, uh, that, that ends my presentation. Liz, I'm going to pass things over to you. Hey, thanks, Chandra. I'm just going to bear with me, everyone. I'm just going to switch the screen view here. Mm -hmm. There we go. There we go. Are you seeing sure. that in full screen now, Chandra? Yes, I am. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. All right. So I'm going to pick up where Chandra left off and we're going to take a little bit of a deeper dive now into LinkedIn 
some interview tips and some resume tips as well. So we're going to start here with LinkedIn. So why bother with LinkedIn? So as Chandra has mentioned, um, the number one method of, of finding work in Canada is really leveraging your network. So LinkedIn is a fantastic uh, networking tool that can really help you to do that. And we know from recent studies that over 72% of employers use LinkedIn to hire people. And a fun fact, three people get hired every single minute through LinkedIn, which is kind of cool. So if we know that 72% of employers are going to go to LinkedIn to find candidates for job opportunities, you need to be found. So having a great profile on LinkedIn will help employers to find you and help you to get hired. Now, the way in which employers use LinkedIn, there's several ways that they do this. So the first thing they might do is they might go to LinkedIn just to search for candidates. They might not even post or advertise the position. The other way that they might do it is they might actually post a job opportunity on the LinkedIn jobs board and you can make sure that you're checking on there and you've set up some alerts on LinkedIn so that you get notified if there's an opportunity within your field. And the third thing that they will often do is use their personal networks to post information about opportunities. So if we go over to the left-hand side of the page here, you'll see that this person, Mandy, is in recruitment at Walmart and Mandy has posted to her LinkedIn network, all the people that she's connected to on LinkedIn, that Walmart is hiring 10,000 associates right across Canada. So this is great information for you to think about perhaps targeting this type of organization if you're looking for some part-time work uh, to build some experience, get, get some funds to help support and pay for your education. Some other things that you might find on LinkedIn. So if we look at the top left here, uh, LinkedIn very um, regularly will post an update on who's hiring across Canada. So what they basically do is they gather all the information about who's hiring and they list it in an editorial blog. So for example, this post mentioned that Statistics Canada is hiring 32,000 people for the census. Um, I have met quite a number of students who have worked for Statistics Canada. They do tend to hire a lot of student interns from time to time. So, you know, it, it's worth taking a look here as well. On the right hand side of the page, you can see some summer internships that have been advertised. These are very recent posts, uh, and this is another great source of you finding relevant opportunities in your field of work. So if you're studying uh, psychology and you're looking for an internship over the summer, LinkedIn may have something posted on there um, that's relevant to your field of study. Bottom right hand corner, this is kind of a cool thing that came out from Bell. So Bell um, actually held a virtual career fair. So it's like a regular career fair, except it's using a virtual platform. This is becoming all the rage with employers. So lots and lots of employers are going down this route now. And they were holding this career fair specifically for STEM students and new grads. So you can get all kinds of really great notifications on here that you might miss otherwise. So bearing in mind that, you know, it's important to get onto LinkedIn and if you can start now, by the time you come to graduate from college or university, you're going to have a phenomenal network that you can tap into that's going to help you land that all important postgrad job as well. So the first thing you need to do is create a profile. And I'll show you some examples in just a minute. Um, I got the permission of my sons to share theirs with you um, at various stages of their career and development. Um, so I'll share with you what a first year student would look like, what a fourth year student might look like and so on. And you want to showcase your experience and your career aspirations. You also want to then start, once you've built your profile, start connecting with people like employers, your parents. I mean, a great place to start is just connect with your parents and maybe your parents' friends, your aunts, your uncles, your neighbors, that hockey coach or soccer coach that you've got a great relationship with. They all probably work in various organizations and starting there is a good place to, to kick off your LinkedIn profile. Also start following and connecting with recruiters in your target organizations. If there's certain types of organization you're interested in, you can connect with them on LinkedIn, you can follow them. That means that you're gonna then see their feeds every time they're posting opportunities and information about the company. And then follow companies that you're interested in. Because what will happen is if you apply to a position, um, say at Bell Canada, 
and they receive your application, they receive your resume, they're going to look at your LinkedIn. And when they see that you've been following them, that's a real indication that you are genuinely interested in their company and they will actually like that. So getting started is half the battle. Let me show you what that might look like. So some of you might be familiar with LinkedIn and some of you may not. Um, so the first thing I want to share with you is a first year student example. So this is somebody who's studying physics and astronomy at the University of Waterloo. Um, just a few things to point out. They've got a professional looking photo. You don't have to dress as formally as this guy, you know, as long as you look professional and smartly dressed, but head and shoulders with a plain background is the best type of photo to have. They have personalized the background to a picture that represents their field of interest. So this is the Hubble telescope, which is uh, obviously very relevant to somebody studying physics and astronomy. So you can find images. There's lots of free stock photos out there and websites such as Unsplash, um, Pexels. There's a whole ton of them. If you just do a Google search for free stock images, uh, you'll come across quite a few. So it could be something like this. It could be um, a simple, you know, clean looking desk with a laptop, anything that represents the professional you. If you're based in Toronto, for example, and you're not exactly sure which direction you want to go in, maybe a nice Toronto skyline would be a good option um, to showcase the area where you're currently studying or something like that. But it just adds a little bit of interest and makes people pay attention to your profile. So beside this person's name, you'll see they're my first level connection. This is one of my sons. Um, so we're obviously, we know each other. That's what first level connection means on LinkedIn. We're connected to each other here. If this had said second level connection, and I want you to use your imagination a little bit. Imagine this guy looks like he's about, you know, 55 instead of the age that he currently is. And it says second level connection. It's got second on here. That would mean that I know this person only because we both have somebody else in common. We both have a mutual connection. So I don't know them personally, perhaps, but I know them by virtue of us both knowing somebody else. LinkedIn will tell you who that mutual connection is. So let's imagine that the person that you're viewing is perhaps the father of one of your friends from school. And maybe they work in one of your target organizations and you're interested in applying for a summer job there. You could ask your friend, hey, do you think your dad would be willing to talk with me or your mom would be willing to talk with me? I'm interested in their company that they work, they work in, and I'm sure they would chat with you and they might even offer to put your resume in front of the hiring person, which is going to be really helpful for you to land that golden opportunity. Now, this title here, Physics and Astronomy Student at the University of Waterloo, this is what we call um, the headline, and you can change this, you can edit this. LinkedIn will automatically populate this with any current position that you hold, but you can edit it to reflect whatever you want. So for example, when this um, person built their profile, they were currently working part-time at Longo's, but they didn't want to advertise, you know, part-time cashier at Longo's in their headline. So they edited it to show that they were a student at the University of Waterloo. Now, this person's just started out. They've only got 11 connections. They're just getting LinkedIn under their belt. That is going to grow over time. On the right hand side, we see the Longos uh, logo because that's a company that they've been working in during high school and their university is listed here. Now, underneath this headline, you'll want to at least at the moment when you first start off, place any experience that you have in this section. So this person worked, as we know, at Longos, they worked at Rona as a customer service advisor, and they've placed a couple of bullets to describe the type of work they did and to showcase some transferable skills. Um, and what's kind of interesting about this one, Chandra mentioned earlier, that getting some work before you even go to university is very helpful to help you to land co-op positions. This is exactly what happened here in the interview for a co-op research assistant position 
physician at one of the hospitals in London, Ontario, um, this person was asked, can you give me an example of a time when you um, identified um, an error in something like quality control type of error? And they were able to share a story about a quality control error that they picked up in Longos. Um, so it might not seem relevant on the surface, but when you get into an interview situation, doing some part time work while you're still in high school gives you lots of great stories to tell. So let's take a look now at a final year student. So this is someone in their fourth year of a film degree. Now it's obvious they're in film because they've customized their background to represent, you know, being on set. Uh, you'll notice that their title underneath their name, so their headline is showing what they're aspiring to be post-graduation, aspiring screenwriter slash colorist. So this is their area of interest. It tells employers what they're looking to do when they graduate. It's a great way of getting that across very, very quickly. And you'll notice that over the period of four years, they've managed to build up quite healthy number of connections, 266 during their time at school. So that's the basics there. The other piece that we haven't talked about yet is something called the about section. In effect, it's like a summary of who you are and the skills and experience that you have within your field. A little short summary is a great idea to quickly give the employer an overview of who you are, what you've done, where your experience lies. And you can also add links to any other sites. So if you've created a personal website, for example, which I know a number of the colleges and universities encourage students to do, you can uh, showcase a personal website on here. This person's got their IMDB page where they've got a bunch of uh, you know, TV shows and films that they've participated in. So you want to add this about section. I'll tell you later why this is important. In fact, on the next slide, we're gonna understand why this would be important moving forward. So LinkedIn has something called all-star status. And this is what I want you all to aim for as you're building your LinkedIn profiles. And the reason I'm recommending this is that when you're an all-star user of LinkedIn, you're 40 times more likely to get contacted by an employer. So it really elevates your profile because what is going to happen? The employer is going to go onto their LinkedIn account. They're going to put in maybe some skills they're looking for or, you know, something that represents the job they're trying to fill. And then all of the profiles are going to appear in front of them. If you have all star status, your profile is going to be further up towards the top. There might be 5,000 profiles that appear and you might be on page 35. If you want to get towards the top and have a greater chance of being on page one, having an all-star status really does help you. So I just want to share with you the key things that you need for all-star status. So you need a nice professional looking photo and background. You need the headline piece with your, your title of how you're branding yourself and that about or summary section. You need to show your location and industry, your edited public profile URL. Now, what that means is when you take out a LinkedIn account, it's going to allocate you a URL. It will have lots of random letters and numbers, but you can actually edit that, clean it up so that it really only just shows like your first and last name. It's a little bit like choosing an email address, which I'm sure you've all done. If that one's already been taken, it will make some suggestions as to how you could change it. You want to have an experience and education section showing and some skills and endorsements. Now, there is a section on LinkedIn called skills. Your best bet to fill in the skills section is to look at a few job postings for the type of work that you're targeting and have a look at the skills requirements, not just technical skills, but the softer skills as well. So the transferable skills that Chandra mentioned earlier, things like organization, attention to detail, leadership, teamwork, communication, and add those skills to your LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn allows you to have up to 50 different skills on there. So really make sure that you add the skills that you genuinely you know, have in, in, in yourself. Um, obviously, you want to be authentic on here. So you want to put as many skills as possible that you match. So if the job postings that you're looking at require you uh, to have some basic knowledge of Python and you've got that basic knowledge, that would be a great thing to add into the skills section. Now, endorsements come from your network. So once you've added skills, anyone that you're connected to can endorse you for those skills. So it's a little bit 
similar to liking them. So they'll be asked, you know, what does Liz know about resumes and interviewing? And if they think I know a lot about resumes and interviewing, they might give me an endorsement for that. So that's the kind of idea. Um, and the more endorsements you have, the more it's going to raise your credibility. The next piece that I would recommend is recommendations. Now, these are different from endorsements because these are written recommendations. It's whereby your connections write a paragraph about you, about what you're like to work with, some great work that you did for them. So what I'd recommend you think about as you go through your career from this point onwards, anytime you do work somewhere, whether it's paid work, whether it's volunteer work, Connect with the people that you worked with on LinkedIn and the ones that you feel really comfortable with, that you feel you had a great relationship with, ask if they would be willing to write a small recommendation for you on the work that you did together. If you do it in the moment when they remember what you've done and they are feeling good about their experience with you, that's the best time to get these written recommendations. Written recommendations carry a lot of weight with employers because it's other people saying nice things about you as opposed to yourself saying things about yourself. So those are some tips. Um, as Chandra mentioned, there is a full tip sheet available for download, and it has the instructions for things like editing your public profile URL. We have some sample headlines and things in there as well to get you started. Let's talk resumes now. So resumes really are your number one marketing tool. We can't get too far these days without a resume, whether it's for volunteering or for paid work. So there's some key sections that you want to think about including in your resume. I'm going to briefly go through them here and then I'm going to walk you through an overview of what a great resume could look like. So the first thing that you want to have on your resume is an opening profile summary. It's a short paragraph that really describes who you are, your transferable skills. It can even have a small objective statement such as currently seeking um, a summer position, um, you know, depending on what stage you're at in your career. So the opening profile summary gives the employer a quick overview of who you are and the skills you have to offer them. It's going to include relevant attributes, skills and knowledge based on the job posting. So you want to customize it as Chandra mentioned for every single opportunity. You also want to include your education and professional development. And what we mean by professional development is any courses that you've undertaken that might be relevant. So, for example, if you happen to do um, a C plus, you know, coding course over the summer, you could add that into your professional development section. The chronology of your work experience, starting with your most recent position. So for some of you, you may never have held a job before. When we get to the resume, I'll show you what you would put in the experience section if you haven't had any paid work. But if you have had paid work, then a chronology of your most recent opportunity working backwards in time. You want to include volunteer and community involvement. Now, most of you will at least have some of that under your belt because you need to get your volunteer hours if you're here in Ontario. Um, certainly, if you're in Canada, you'll need to have your volunteer hours to graduate from high school. Um, so volunteering and community involvement is a great thing to include uh, on your resume. Other things to consider, languages. So if you speak more than one language, um, then it's worth adding to the resume. You never know. Uh, the person that you're going to be working for may do business in different countries and those language skills might be beneficial. They may have customers who speak different languages. If you're going to work in a bank, for example, part time over the summer, you might meet customers with all different language skills. Uh, so it's worth putting on the resume. Any associations or club memberships that you've belonged to. So this could be, for example, if you were part of the debate club at school, the chess club, um, the marketing club, um, the robotics club, all of these types of things are valuable to include. Any awards or recognitions? Have you had any awards for academics or for sports um, or any volunteer awards as well? These would be great to add to help you stand out from the crowd. 
Any public speaking experience, if that might be relevant to your target position, would be great as well. Um, I guess debate club could be one of them, um, or maybe you've done some public speaking um, as part of a volunteer position, anything like that. And then interests, anything that says something positive about the professional you. So even interests can show skills. If you've been on sports teams, that tells me a little bit about your team skills, your collaboration, and so on. One thing I'm going to caution you with on resumes is something called applicant tracking systems. Now, applicant tracking systems or ATS systems are used by the vast majority of employers in Canada. So what these systems basically do is they take your resume. This is when you're applying to online positions. They're going to take your resume. They're going to put it through their applicant tracking system. And that system has been programmed with keywords from the job posting. So all of the skills, knowledge and experience requirements in the posting, the ATS system is going to look for those things in your resume. If you do not have those keywords in your resume, you'll get a lower score and it may never be read by the HR person. So your goal initially is to get past the applicant tracking system. Of course, you still have to be authentic and you can't start putting skills in that you don't have, but you do want to try and match their wording as close as possible. So, for example, if the job posting says, um, you know, good understanding and knowledge of MS Office and your resume says Microsoft Office, I want you to change it to MS Office, match it exactly. And the other thing you need to be aware of is the format of your resume has a big impact on these ATS systems. So many of you may have seen these fancy infographic style resumes, the more modern looking ones that you find templates for online. And they've got like a box where you can put your photo and then they've got grids and boxes all over the place in a non-standard format. They do look very nice. They look clean, they look professional, but the vast majority of the time, they are not going to work with applicant tracking systems. So often we hear from students and grads who tell us I'm applying for all these jobs and I'm not getting anywhere. And we can look at their resume and see that they're qualified, but they're using an infographic style of resume and they're not getting past these ATS systems. So please use a standard style of resume like the one I'm about to show you to get past those ATS systems and make sure there's no hidden tables or grids in your documents, folks. Here's an example of a high school student's resume. I can't go through all the detail because we're going to run out of time today, but I'll give you the high level of what should go where. So at the very top, this is where you put your contact details. Applicant tracking systems will sometimes require a postal code. So make sure you put your postal code, your city, your province. One phone number, make sure you've got a voicemail so that they can leave messages for you if possible your email address, and if you have a LinkedIn, put your LinkedIn URL on here as well. This is the summary section, the profile section. This is where you're going to describe yourself. And this person obviously is in the French immersion, so they're a bilingual student. They mentioned some skills, responsibility, initiative, organization, collaboration skills. And if these are required in the job posting, they're getting a nice match for the ATS system here. They've got both paid work experience and volunteer experience in a number of different areas like food service within daycares and camps, and they mention their natural leadership skills. So this is great for getting all those nice transferable skills in here that employers want to see. Underneath your profile summary, this is where you're most likely going to put your education and courses. So most students and grads are going to really sell their education first before the experience because you're really at the start of your career journey. So you're going to start with your, you know, most recent um, experience. So in this case, it's ABC High School. They're still there. And then they've listed some great courses that shows a nice variety of things like leadership certificates. We've got first aid in the Bronze Cross. We've got a human anatomy um, course that they've taken. They've got babysitting course, a whole range of nice things that just shows this whole sort of approach to continuous learning and employers love to see continuous learning on resumes. Um, we know the one thing for sure we're going to face um, as we go forward is change in organizations. So this is great. They love to see this. 
Then we get into what we call the relevant experience section. So for this particular individual, they actually have held, you know, three different part time jobs over the years during their high school years. And they're listing the name of the organization, the title they held, and then on the right hand side, the years that they've been working there. And then underneath, we've got a few bullets to show the types of activities that they're involved in, which again, is demonstrating some great transferable skills like supervision, mediation, um, you know, re restocking dishes and so on, and being organized and diligent, being prepared to roll up your sleeves, all of that great stuff. And this is great because they've got some nice relevant uh, transferable skills to show an employer but you might be wondering well what do i do if i haven't held any part-time jobs yet so what i'm going to suggest that you do if you have any volunteer experience i would pull that volunteer experience into the relevant experience section because at the end of the day employers don't care whether it was paid work or volunteer work they want to see the skills so you could list your volunteer experience use the bullets to describe what you did during those volunteer opportunities you could even list projects that you did at school and list out some of the things that you were involved in so if there was a massive project you got involved in in high school that could feature in relevant experience as long as you have some bullets to show things such as leadership and communication um, and team working and all of that great stuff maybe you had to do a presentation you can showcase your presentation skills so think creatively about what do you have in your experience that's still relevant even if it wasn't paid work so projects volunteer work um, any leadership roles maybe you led a particular club or, or association or anything like that can go in the relevant experience section now because this high school student already has three uh, paid work experiences they've decided to separate out their volunteer experience and you can see they've got a variety of things on here and then they've got a whole section on awards and recognition so you could put awards and recognitions in a separate section like this student because they have some pretty impressive stuff they were valedictorian they got some other student awards for french and english and producing a video and so on or you could place these awards and recognitions actually in the education section. So I'll just flip back there for you. You could have education courses and awards, something like that, depending on how many items you have to put in the section. So the last section on this resume is interests, and they're just showing a nice range of interests from team based sports to individual sports to more creative pursuits. So just showing a well rounded kind of individual here. The last tips section I'm going to share with you today is some interview tips and Chandra has already talked a little bit about interviewing. So again, we have a full tip sheet on interviewing as well to help you. But to perform well at an interview, I think the thing to remember is by the time you get to the interview folks, they already are impressed. They've been impressed by your resume. So do take some confidence from that. They already think you can probably do the job. Now they want to find out more about you and see if you would be a good fit for them in their organization. So here's some quick tips. First of all, preparation is key. So know your resume inside out. Whatever you've written on your resume, make sure you've got examples to back it up. So if you say on your resume, you're a natural leader, be prepared to share an example of when you've demonstrated that natural leadership, whether it's at school, whether it's at work, whether it's volunteering and so on. Know the job posting inside out as well. So really scrutinize the job posting. What are the skills and competencies they're looking for in that job posting? Because those are the areas you'll get questions about. So just think to yourself, okay, if they're asking for customer service skills, if they're asking for good team working skills, you're gonna get a question about when you've demonstrated those skills. So think through some examples that you can share at the interview. Do your research on the company. This can really help you to stand out from the competition. A great example, um, Chandra and I have a good friend and her son was interviewing um, for a, a position, I believe it was at McDonald's. And they asked him why he wanted to work for the organization. And he'd done his research on them and he knew about their charitable work and the Ronald McDonald house and uh, all of that stuff that they do there. And he told a personal story about how he um, had grown his hair 
uh, to a really long length and then had it cut off so that it could be made into a wig for cancer patients. And then he linked that to the values of the organization that he was interviewing for, who were very invested in charitable pursuits and the work that they were doing through the Ronald McDonald House really resonated with him. And they loved that and he got the job and he did really well in the organization. Prepare your answers to typical and behavioral questions. It really is not rocket science. It really is preparation and practice. The more you practice, the more confident you will become and the better you will do. Now, when it comes to typical questions, here's some examples. Why do you want to work here? So you've reviewed your job posting so you can build a story of all of your experience and skills that would match the qualities they're looking for. Tell me about yourself. Uh, why do you want to work here? We talked about the Ronald McDonald example there. What are your strengths and what is your weakness? You've got to be prepared for both of those. Now, when it comes to your strengths, look at the job posting and ask yourself, OK, what are some of the core skills they're looking for? And which of those would I say are my top strengths? Those are the ones you want to emphasize in this answer. What is your weakness? This is really designed to figure out when you know that you need to work on something, what do you do about it and how do you improve? So if one of the things you've struggled with is maybe your organizational skills, what have you done to improve in that area? Um, so really dig deep on that one and try to come up with something genuine that you're currently working on. Example behavioral questions. Now, behavioral questions are really designed to figure out how have you handled situations in the past so that you can tell them a story about how you handled it, and then they'll understand how you're likely to deal with those things in the future. If you were successful approaching a problem in a certain way in the past, it's likely you will replicate that going forward. So you can tell if it's a behavioral question requiring what Chandra called a star story response, um, because you'll get something like, can you tell me about, can you describe a time when, can you describe the most? These are all clues that they want a star story response. And our tip sheet has an example of how to build a star story. Um, one of the ones that you will often get when it's about cash handling. So let's say you're going to be a cashier in a grocery store. They will often ask you, tell me about a moral dilemma you've encountered and how you dealt with it, which is a really tricky one. But some examples of the kinds of things maybe you've come across, perhaps you had a good friend who asked you to help them cheat on a test or, um, you know, perhaps somebody told you um, something in confidence, but you felt compelled that you had to do something about it, you know, for their own safety or you know there can be all kinds of moral dilemmas that you've encountered over the years so if you are going for a position where you may be in a situation where trust and integrity is going to be paramount make sure you've got a nice example you can share Ask them questions about the job, the team, and the company. Usually towards the end of the interview, they're going to ask you, do you have any questions for us? And the worst thing you can do is say, no, I don't have any questions because they take that as you're not interested in the organization. So make sure you go prepared with a list of about eight to 10 questions. They'll likely answer some of them um, as part of the interview discussion, but at least then you'll have one or two left that you can ask at the end. It shows great great interest. So if there's something you find out in your research, maybe ask a question about that as well. A great question might be, what would the training program look like if I was to join your team? Now, we're going to finish up today with a quick discussion on virtual interviews. They are very, very common in today's world. They have taken over the world of interviewing. They can be either live virtual interviews or pre-recorded virtual interviews. And no doubt you're all sick to death of Zoom by now. Um, it is a common platform that employers will use, but they may also use Skype or, you know, Microsoft Teams or Google, um, Google Meets, those kind of platforms. So just some quick tips. Dress smartly and professionally as if you're having an in-person meeting. Make sure the background's tidy, your bed's made, there aren't clothes on the floor and, you know, cup, em empty cups and half-eaten burgers in the background. You know, just make sure it looks nice and clean. One of the trickiest parts of being interviewed on a virtual platform is to look at the camera, not at the screen. So your camera 
often is in the lid of your laptop right at the top on the top bar and try to get used to looking in there. One tip is to get a little yellow sticky with a smiley face on it and put it next to the camera so that you actually look at the camera and not in the middle of the screen, just as a reminder. And do smile, you know, look engaged when you're chatting with them and show enthusiasm, look relaxed and, and try to build rapport. Make sure you've switched off your cell phone and any other devices that might ring in the background. Practice with your technology in advance if you're not familiar with the platform. And if you want to have a few notes, place them at eye level on little yellow stickies, either side of your camera, just with some bullet points. Don't write your answers out word for word because they can tell when you're reading word for word, just some little bullet points to jog your memory. And avoid filler words such as like, um, ah, uh, and if you're not sure whether you use them often, do what Chandra suggested earlier, do a practice, record yourself, listen back to it, and then you'll hear those, those little filler words. So that brings us to the end of our session today, and we've got some time for questions in just a second. Um, as I mentioned, the tip sheets are in the ELOF Careers Exhibitor booth, and Chandra mentioned if you're interested in our courses, you can find those on our website. But one of the things you might want to do is follow us on social. We do post weekly job seat search tips um, for our connections and followers that might just help you as you're going through this process. All right, so Logan, I'm going to pass it over to you to see if there's any questions. Sure thing. Thanks so much. Uh, there are some questions. We'll try to uh, tackle them in the order in which they were received. Um, how can students find employment that aligns with their field of study? Uh, if they've got an ambition to become, say, a licensed psychologist, how can they sort of in their employment prospects uh, toward that ultimate goal. Yeah, I can, uh, I'll jump in, take the first one here, Liz. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, if you're looking specifically, I mean, doing some research in terms of organizations that would uh, be employing licensed psychologists would be a great idea. And I often, Liz and I will send people to the library to do research um, or call the library, talk to the business librarian and say, you know, how do I find these organizations in my area? Um, also, perhaps uh, the professors at your school ask them whether they're aware of employers that you should um, uh, look at. Uh, remember, though, that no matter where you work, if you can get into a professional environment, if you can gain, you know, as a licensed psychologist, I would imagine you're going to need great communication skills um, and some other transferable skills. So if you think about the profession in that way, what are the skills I need to develop to be in this field of work? And then could you find a job that will help you develop those skills? So that would be a way to look at it as well. And Liz, anything to add? Yeah, just to build on that, I think those are all fantastic tips, Chandra, is just to, you know, what we were talking about earlier, leverage LinkedIn. Is there anybody in your network that you know who works in this field that could maybe be open to an informational interview where you sit down with them, you ask them a bunch of questions about, you know, what it's like to work in that field and what tips can they give you for somebody starting out looking for opportunities to gain experience. It really is about networking. If you can start networking from day one, um, of your college and university career, that's going to really um, stand you in good stead for the times when you're looking for those opportunities. So again, leverage your networks, um, find out who the sort of, you know, eminent players are in your field and see if you can follow them and connect with them. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, great advice. Um, another question, is it smart to keep a achievements from your high school years on your resume when you're looking for work uh, after post-secondary? Or is there sort of, is too much time elapsed? Um, so do you want me to jump in, Chandra? Oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think it really depends what that achievement is and how impressive it is. Um, if you have sufficient achievements that you've gained during your post-secondary education experience that kind of overshadow what you did in high school, then maybe you could leave that off. Um, you know, it's typically it's recommended for um, graduates that um, they don't need to mention the high school piece by that stage. Um, but if it's something really impressive, you may want to include it. So it's, it's there's no real hard and fast rule there. 
Thanks. Um, uh, how would students with no real interview experience or work experience, um, though maybe with some extracurriculars under their belt, uh, how would these students go about securing uh, an internship or, or co-op uh, without any real prior experience? Yeah, I'll jump in on this one. I think the really important thing to remember is that you do have experience even if it isn't paid employment. Um, so thinking about, and Liz, Liz touched on it briefly, but thinking about do you have uh, school projects, volunteer work, uh, team involvement, etc., that would demonstrate to an employer um, transferable skills that you bring to the table and making sure that you bring those into a resume. Our um, resumes that win course that we sell on our website, it, it talks about a concept called relevant experience and building a resume with relevant experience. And it's not just about paid experience, it's about any experience you've had. So um, think, about, think about building your resume in that way so that you can show those skills that you have. Uh, great. Um, we're coming close to time. I will try to get a few more questions in, but before we do, uh, what is the best next step for folks who maybe don't, we don't have time to get to their question? Uh, what, what can they, what can they do? Um, well, I guess if they're, uh, if they want to, and Logan, you tell me, is the exhibitor booth available or they can certainly, you know, connect to us on LinkedIn. Um, if there's any final questions that we don't get to today, that's probably the best. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, the booth will be open uh, for folks, but uh, whether you'll be there to answer them is totally up to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Liz and I can dip in uh, over the next couple of days if there's any uh, questions for sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so if we don't get to your question, and, and there's certainly more than we'll have time to uh, drop by the EVE off the booth and uh, add the question there, and hopefully uh, sure. Liz and Chandra can, can get to you. Um, we'll try to get a couple of more in here, even though we're over time. Uh, if For folks who are working during post-secondary, uh, how do you advise that they manage their study and work hours? How do, how do they find that balance? Hmm. Well, I think there's been some um, sort of uh, research done that suggests that 15 hours of work is the optimal amount of hours without it, you know, becoming overwhelming. Um, and uh, so, so that would be what I would think about, first of all, is how many hours can you manage? And it really depends on the program you're doing. For example, if you're doing engineering, that's going to be really tricky. It's very, very much a full-on, full-time program. Um, but if you only have maybe 10 or 12 hours of classes every week, then maybe you can manage a little bit more. So I think it's about getting um, some method of organizing your time, maybe getting a big wall planner up or doing it on a, an online tool that you can download or a spreadsheet and really map out what are your deadlines, plan out when you're going to be studying, when you're in class, when does that leave you time for working and just really make sure you're organized um, so that you don't let the, the ball drop on anything. Chandra, anything to add? No, uh, no, I think that's uh, that's great advice. It is really about getting organized for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. We'll just do a couple of more here. Uh, is there an ideal time to join LinkedIn? Is it ever too soon? That's a, a great question. I mean, I, I, I think that joining LinkedIn when you start post-secondary, so Liz had shown mm. the example of a first-year student, I, I think that's a great time uh, to join. I, I don't know that you need to join in high school. I mean, you could maybe in your senior year, in your last year. Um, but Liz, would you agree sort of first year would be a great time to kick it off and then starting yeah. to build your networks from there? Yeah, I would say so. I, I wouldn't wait until you're ready to graduate. I think mm -hmm. if you can start in your first year. Um, so like my my youngest son is just finishing up his first co-op placement. He's, he's in his second year now and he's got over um, 150 connections now. And he started off with 11, as you saw. Um, and some of those connections now are in industry um, because he's got this co-op placement. And you're, you'll be connecting with fellow students and those fellow students are going to be landing jobs in the future um, and you want to keep those connections going and those networks alive so I think yeah first year is a good time you know dip your toe in start to get used to the platform it is a platform that should be kept up to date on a regular basis so every time you change a job you take a new course you develop a new skill just pop into LinkedIn and do a little update um, and you know if you follow people like us on there you're going to get your job search tips on a weekly basis so that you'll be ready for the job market. 
Beauty. Okay, thanks so much. I think we're out of time. I know uh, Suzanne is here to sort of give us a sign off, but do you folks have any sort of parting words before we let you go? Uh, well, uh, wishing everybody the best getting out there. If, if you're in the job market, and please do take advantage of our, um, you know, our resources on at the exhibitor booth and and check those out. And yeah, thank you for, uh, for being here today and your attention during the session. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah, best of luck, everyone with your mm -hmm. education journey and also with your job search as you progress.